Texas Medicine Work Group. Um, Representative uh, uh, Foster is running a couple minutes behind. Um, so I'm going to give her a few more minutes. And I did want to take the liberty of um, having a moment of silence for my uh, dear friend Q Williams, Representative Williams, and from Middletown, um, who we lost tragically uh, last Thursday morning. And uh, he was in uh, the, the same. Uh, class that uh, Representative Gilcrest and I, and I think Representative Kennedy, you were in that same class as well. So um, all three of our classes. So if we could just have a minute to uh, reflect on all of the wonderful things he's done uh, for the state of Connecticut. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I appreciate it. And all of your warm wishes and stories have been so appreciated by everyone in the legislature. It seems like he touched so many people and uh, everything has just been really lovely to hear those stories. And uh, I hope you can keep his mother queen and his uh, wife um, in your uh, thoughts and prayers over the next several weeks as in months. It's, the uh, heart, it is very difficult um, after the, um, when it all reality kind of sets in. So uh, your thoughts and prayers are appreciated. I'm just going to go ahead and kick off the meeting and uh, allow my co-chair, Representative Kennedy, to offer any remarks or any comments that she has for today. Just wonderful to see everybody. Happy New Year. It is um, a little bit of a somber way to start the meeting. Um, as uh, Rick da da Jason said, we all came in together and I just will never forget him. I just remember that big smile and uh, so welcoming. So, but I'm um, looking forward to continuing our work here and let's get it done. Thanks. So Sounds good. Thank you so much, Rep. Kennedy. Uh, I also see Representative Gilcrest, the Chair of Human Services on the call. Um, she's probably just wanting to listen in and see how everything's going for this work group, um, but wanted to offer her a minute if she wanted to say anything. Great. Thank you so much. Um, you nailed it, though. Just, uh, yeah, logging on to better understand this topic um, and just happy to be here today. Thank you for the opportunity. Excellent. Well, we're we're very happy to have you leading human services, and I'm glad to hear that you want to listen in. Uh, if you hadn't heard, uh, Representative Foster is running a few minutes behind, so I'm just going to go ahead and kick things off here um, with uh, our review of sample legislation. The first uh, item on our agenda after introductions. Um, I didn't know uh, we do have. Um, Hopefully, uh, people have had a chance to um, look at the agenda. Um, and I did want to, before jumping into this, because I did want uh, Representative Foster to kind of lead that discussion, uh, really to have uh, an opportunity from some of the different folks um, on this call that have been involved with the uh, Food as Medicine work group. Um, and just wanted to uh, give folks an opportunity to um, introduce themselves and um, uh, kind of their their thoughts so far um, that we've had as part of this working group. We start um, maybe with Brent Miller from OHS. I see you are at the top right, uh, top of my corner here. Perfect. The Brady Box Square. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brent Miller. I work for the Connecticut Office of Health Strategy and the Health Innovation Department. I apologize. My voice is a little scratchy today. I think I'm starting to come down with a cold. We're at that beginning piece. Um, so I do apologize for, for the state of my voice, but uh, Representative 
uh, Dathan, did you want me to speak a little bit about what we're thinking about with food as medicine as absolutely. well? Absolutely. If you can just have, you know, a minute, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of what we've been trying to think about with Buddhist medicine is also the, the broader uh, environment that people are experiencing. And a lot of that comes down to social determinants of health. So when we think about, you know, food access, asking why, right? Why don't people have access to, to good, healthy, nutritious food? And what we have found is that, uh, you know, this usually boils down to different kinds of social determinants of health, like think about transportation, right? Being able to get from one area to another. Uh, it could just be where you live, right? If we think about food deserts or food swamps, um, there's, there's multiple different reasons. Uh, and also really trying to work with communities to work with them and understand from their perspective, what are the root causes to poor health? right? So what, what are they telling us? Because it's one thing for Brent and Hartford to say, I think we should do X, but it's another thing to speak with people on the ground in their communities and say, what do you think we need to do about X? Um, and then I think that's, and I guess I think the third thing I would add in, uh, and not to take too much time, uh, but is just really working together, right? Um, this is such a big issue. And the more that the state agencies can work together uh, with the legislator and all the different stakeholders and with the communities, right, is really essential at the end of the day to make sure that if, if I can use a crew example, that we're, we're all rowing in the same direction. Thank you. Well, that's super important. Uh, as a mother of a crew um, son, uh, if you're not going on the same direction, it's uh, an uphill battle, really. Um, Thank you so much for that. Uh, Heather um, Procaccio. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Heather Procaccio. I'm representing the Connecticut Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics today. Thank you for having me. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Max Perkins from Unite. Yep, Max Perkins, Senior Policy Manager for, the, for Unite Us, covering the Northeast region of the country. Great. And Melissa Carr, um, you gave a great... Uh, presentation a couple weeks ago, if you maybe could just summarize that in one sentence for the folks that weren't able to make that meeting. Yeah, sure. Melissa Carr, sales executive at Unite Us in the Northeast, and I work on Connecticut. Um, really, you know, we focus on connecting people to social care and needs like food. Uh, and like Brent was talking about, how do we actually address SDOH in our communities? And so we um, enable connections through technology and then also um, enable um, organizations, task force like yourself, government entities to look at the reporting and really understand where are we having impact, where are there continued gaps in care, and how do we use that information to iterate our programs moving forward to become more effective and really address those root causes within our communities. Thanks for Great. having me. Thank you for coming again. Uh, Megan Smith. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm Megan Smith, the Senior Director of Community Health Transformation at the Connecticut Hospital Association. I'm joined by my colleague. I'll just save the introductions. I can do both of us at once. Um, but Brian Cornoyer, um, who's with our advocacy and government relations team. So um, we are very interested on, on behalf of our, our hospitals who have um, many who have robust programs in addressing food as a health-related social need and thinking about both uh, clinical and non-clinical interventions to promote food and nutrition security. So thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Nancy Trout. Hello, um, I'm Nancy Trout. I'm from Connecticut Children. So I am representing the medicine side of food as medicine uh, and also sort of on my one of my hats is actually just clinical and taking care of patients. And the other is uh, through the Office for Community Child Health, um, where we are actually um, currently, we have a um, 
food insecurity screening and produce voucher program, which we are, I feel very uh, up on obstacles <laughs> to redemption um, and just, you know, the logistics and, uh, and how um, we can help families. And, uh, and I think, again, just looking at sort of policy and funding, which is kind of what everything, you know, ultimately comes down to. So um, happy to be here with everybody. Great. Thank you so much for lending your expertise. Uh, Dan Giacomi, Giacomi, sorry. No problem. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Dan Giacomi. I am the state SNAP director working or representing rather the Connecticut Department of Social Services. Um, opposite Nancy, I'm on the food side of it, the food as medicine conversation, um, but here with my colleague, uh, Dave Seifel, who can introduce himself in a moment as well. But as I said, representing DSS uh, and not only the SNAP program, but our Medicaid program as well. Um, worked extensively with many of you uh, on this and excited to continue the work and seeing, as Brent kind of mentioned, how we can break down some of those barriers, be able to share data both internally and amongst uh, agencies to ensure that uh, health outcomes and food security are both tied together as well as they can be. Wonderful. Um, Jeannie Hurst. Thank you, Rep. Dathan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jenny Hirsch. I'm the Chief of Staff at Connecticut Food Share. Um, we're so pleased and excited uh, with the progress this group has made and, and all of the energy in the room and um, looking forward to seeing where, where this all leads. Great. Thank you so much. I have seen that uh, Rep. Foster has joined. I'm going to let you jump in. We we're just doing a, a couple of quick introductions. And when I kind of finish, I was hoping that you could jump in and talk about some of the sample legislation, but uh, just wanted to give you an opportunity to have a couple of quick words first. Thanks so much for um, taking on the introductions today, Rep. Dathan. Um, hey, everybody. I just have to tell you that um, it's exciting to be at this point at the beginning of legislative session. Um, I had been talking to many people who are in this Zoom room um, while I was at the White House conference on hunger and health about how we sort of felt this momentum. Um, and I'm really hoping that this group and all the membership will help us carry that momentum into this legislative session so we can um, take advantage of what's happening federally and make some real meaningful progress for our constituents and the folks in the state of Connecticut. And I feel optimistic um, that we have the right brain trust and compassion trust and hearts and effort in this room. Um, and we'll build our group and keep on moving this work forward. So thank you very much. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna just uh, ask Michael Werner, if you can uh, jump in next, that would be great. Thank you very much, Representative Dathan. My name is Michael Warner. I'm the lead aging policy analyst for the Commission on Women, Children, Seniors, Equity and Opportunity. And we had the privilege to speak before this group uh, in December. We brought forward a couple of recommendations, including the establishment of a permanent coordinator, perhaps with the Department of Agriculture, to oversee a standing work group like this and to perhaps um, have the state of Connecticut hold annual summits where we bring together some of these stakeholders from all over the state who produce this food, who are close to the actual production of the food and also to um, folks from SDE and DSS and other places who help can, uh, to get the food uh, to the people. So thank you very much and we're happy to be here today. It's great having you involved. Uh, David uh, Seifel, and apologies if I've got your name wrong. Seifel, I wasn't sure. Yep, it's, um, <clears throat> hi, David Seifel, uh, legislative liaison from the Department of Social Services. Um, nice to be here. Uh, uh, you know, Dan sort of spoke on behalf of the department. He's our, he's our SNAP expert. Um, I'll leave it at that. And uh, yeah, just happy to be here. Thanks. Great. Um, Kaylee uh, Royston from DOAC. Hi, everybody. My name is Kaylee Royston. I am the legislative director here at the Department of Agriculture. And as I know, uh, Dan sort of mentioned and Michael gave a nice brief intro, we are on the food production sort of side of things. We run the Farmers Market Nutrition Program, and we do a lot of work with Dan through their WIC office and sort of build that. So our sort of contribution is the food production aspect and making sure that people have access to local healthy food as often as possible. 
We also took on a really large role during the pandemic as far as food security and making sure that the funding that was coming into the state was quickly dispersed to Connecticut residents. That was such great work. Thank you for that. Um, next, jumping into Hillary Felton Reed. If you want to say anything. <laughs> Yes, hi, no, uh, Hillary Felton Reed. I'm a lobbyist with Robinson and Cole, and we represent Unite Us. Thanks for having us. Great. Uh, Melanie uh, Flaherty. Hi, hi, Representative Dathan. Melanie Flaherty, also a lobbyist with the Connecticut Government Relations Group of Robinson and Cole, and we represent Unite Us. Thanks for having us. Excellent. Uh, Megan uh, Baker. Thank you, Representative. My name is Megan Baker. I am the Asian American Pacific Islander Policy Analyst for the Commission on Women, Children, Seniors, Equity and Opportunity. I uh, wanted to thank Michael for introducing the agency and again echo um, the sentiments of, of everyone on the call, excited to give access to quality resources um, to combat social detriments of health and super excited as a policy agency to delve into making this legislatively pragmatic after it failed last session. So thanks for being here um, and excited to see you all again. Thank you so much, Megan. And Judith uh, Dowd. She might be tied up in something else. I'm gonna pass to Jamie Foster, uh, sorry, Representative Foster for her to go through the sample legislation. You should have gotten it, an email um, with some of the ideas. Um, but I'm going to let her um, kind of talk through some of the ideas that we've been having as a committee. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks for um, your attention. I know this email went out late, and so I'm not sure everyone has had an opportunity to give um, a real deep dive into the examples that we shared from other states. But um, you know, after reviewing um, minutes and um, the videos from the meetings that we've had so far, um, it I think that um, there's a couple of uh, like opportunities to grab on and move forward in things that were here. I, I want to sort of um, first say that like we went, um, we got narrow like from implementation and then we went wide again with like why we're intervening with the social determinants of health um, in the presentations. And so in the beginning we had like some more technical, like we could do this and it would have this effect. And then we went wider again with OHS sort of talking about social determinants of health and pragmatically why food and nutrition are related to the things that we want to address. And so in working through um, what has been discussed and what was in the original bill proposal, um, we have um, four examples of bills in other states that have, have worked to achieve food as medicine. Um, and so the California example is included um, because um, it includes something that was discussed, but it wasn't sort of like the sort of like, I think leading likely scenario and that's medically tailored meals. Mechanistically in Connecticut, I think that that would go through a Meals on Wheels style um, delivery method, which did not seem like we had at this moment in time, not like in spirit, um, the sort of momentum to move behind an option like that. Um, also, there is some federal money for programming like that, but it doesn't seem like it's the same um, like critical mass that I think we're observing in fruit and veg prescription programs, which I think we're approaching. Um, and so um, the North Carolina, Massachusetts, and Virginia examples are on um, fruit and veg or produce prescription programs. Um, and so I think that I, I included the California example because in the research from OLR and from Chilpi, um, these were the examples that have been presented to us. But I do believe that, and, and I hope people will tell me if they feel differently, but I do believe that, that the momentum was really more there for something like a fruit and vegetable prescription program. Um, and so there's these sort her of three is, examples. Uh, that, she's brilliant. I love her, but her voice is horrid. Wow. <laughs> Um, um, I'm gonna oh, ask folks to mute themselves if you're not speaking. Um, so anyways, um, the North Carolina, Massachusetts, and Virginia produce prescription programs um, are, I think, the most viable options. And essentially, these are different amounts of money um, that are um, 
well, in the North Carolina and the Virginia example, different amounts of money for funding a state pilot of a produce prescription program, which again, as a reminder, is this sort of restricted um, get, uh, gift card or debit card that would offer the purchase of um, of fruit and fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, in the Massachusetts example, they um, had successful legislation that was then they turned away from because they had an 1115 waiver. And I think my big question, though I'd like to hear sort of thematically from folks about what they think of these um, examples, but I think thematically what I'm interested in is if people feel like in Connecticut, the 1115 waiver is the best way to achieve something like this, or if it's a separate appropriation. And I think I have a, a gut feeling, but I really would like to hear from the group. And I don't know if that question is most appropriately addressed to DSS, and it's fine if you don't feel comfortable answering that question today and we get back to it. But I think we're at this point now where I'd like feedback from the group on you know, where people feel about those two mechanisms or if there's something that I'm missing. So Representative Foster, thank you. Um, obviously speaking uh, right now on behalf of DSS, I, I would prefer if we take that back to look. I know we've spoken before about uh, 1115 waivers and kind of the process that goes through and the timeline that goes through trying to get approval on one. Uh, however, neither Dave nor I are, are uh, anywhere near experts in that field. And we've already kind of flagged that we think it would be a good idea if we bring in our Medicaid director or uh, someone from our Department of Health Services to speak on that side of it and the Medicaid piece of it, rather than trying to give everyone uh, half information or information that may be you know, separate or, or uh, in opposition to some of their current plans. Um, I totally appreciate that. And just for the benefit of the rest of the group, because the bill proposal deadline is Friday, um, we are likely going to be in a position where something is introduced and we know that there might be changes, hopefully before this gets to a public hearing. Um, but um, I think the legislative team and um, DSS can work together and learn more about that afterwards. I still want to hear from the rest of the group on, you know, their other thoughts and feelings and on this too. So, um, but yeah, Dan, I really appreciate yours and David's um, partnership in um, working on this. And I appreciate the good, <laughs> the sentiment that it's a good idea. Um, thank you, Dan. Anyone else? I'm just this is I'm just going to make a comment on, you know, the California, the medically tailored meal option versus the um, produce prescription program, because just for for children, since I'm a pediatrician, you know, that the the um, medically tailored meals really tend to be more for adults who have chronic conditions because of their long-term, you know, poor nutrition or um, other comorbidities. So I think just in terms of a more, a more global um, help for families that the produce prescription program, um, you know, would definitely for me be, you know, the better program, at least for my little cohort that I'm taking care of. Well, we appreciate um, yours and the Connecticut children's perspective in what we're doing. And I'm glad that you can be here um, to talk about it. I tend to agree. Um, and I think that the data um, on this kind of work suggests that there might be a more dramatic positive influence on a single individual's you know, medical outcomes with medically tailored meals, particularly if they had nutritional inadequacy prior. But there's good emerging data that I, you know, that I think we're approaching places where we can say that we understand this to be the field, that there's like a familial impact of produce prescription programs, similarly to, you know, WIC having like a family extended benefit, um, not just to the targeted child. Um, I think that that's what we would see here. And I think, you know, as, as an ad advocate whose heart and passion is in anti-hunger, I think that it's important to not just think about one target individual. I think if we can help more, especially since some of these diseases are familial and there's genetic and, you know, social determinants that are affecting a whole family unit and not just the target of the intervention. So that's a great point, Dr. Trout. Thank you for sharing that. Others? 
Brett Froster, this is Max Perkins from Unitas. Um, you know, 1115 waivers can be extremely powerful tools. Um, we're excited about some of the states that are that are moving into that space to address the social determinants of health. But I would say, I guess, the maybe the potentially the one drawback would be that um, CMS is currently limiting new food and nutrition services, paid services to about six months in, in waiver states. And so if you were to craft something through the legislature in Connecticut, you'd have more creative control to, to draw the boundaries as, as you think are appropriate for the state. So I, th I think maybe that would be the one one benefit, but 1115 waivers uh, are obviously extremely powerful because you get to leverage federal financing for those interventions. Yeah, I think those are really excellent and strong points. And I think when we think about pursuing these legislatively, either option has its like uh, strengths and weaknesses in feasibility of passing both chambers and securing an appropriation support. Um, and so, you know, those are all things we're going to have to consider um, as we move forward. I'm curious um, from a Unite Us perspective, if you have any experience, I mean, your platform offers such strong data and analytic capacity. If you have any understanding or ideas of, of differences in longevity of an, an intervention like this, I, I think in this peer reviewed science space, duration of an intervention, I, there's not um, a study that I'm aware of that does that, but because of your sort of data platform, are you familiar with anything that might help us understand if six months, you know, might, you know, versus another option might be meaningful for a nutrition related intervention? Yeah, I could take it back and ask some colleagues internally, particularly on our research and evaluation team for some help. Um, you know, in the government sphere, again, I'm most familiar with the 1115 waiver states, North Carolina, Massachusetts, California, Oregon, those, and those are all time limited. So I'd have to, I'd have to go back and ask. And most of those peer reviewed studies, just so everyone knows, like to date are, but and, and those people have like market improvements in diabetes and cardiovascular diseases during these six month interventions. What is really left unknown in the scientific literature is when the intervention ends, if there's like a regression in disease status or a maintained benefit, or if longer duration or a tapered down intervention would make a difference. And that's one of the benefits of the 1115 waiver is that it's designed to pilot an intervention and inform what the latter intervention would be. It's designed to sort of test, um, retest, evaluate and improve and change. Um, though I think like people live on 1115 waivers for quite a long time as though it's the intervention, not 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 that sort of like evaluative um, pilot, but yes, that's helpful. Thank you, Max. Anyone else? Dan has his hand up. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Rep Foster, I did want to perhaps ask a question. And, and uh, the question itself would go to the scope, as you kind of mentioned earlier, as to what we would like to do. And the reason I guess I pose that question is, you know, when you go through an 1115 waiver, not that there's anything wrong with them. I think there, as you mentioned, are great tools for looking at different interventions and, and studying. But I, I feel though an 1115 waiver firmly puts the issue of unhealthy eating as a medical issue rather than necessarily looking at it holistically and seeing if there's other areas as Brent mentioned in the beginning of our conversation, uh, whether it be food deserts or uh, lack of school meals or things of that nature that contribute to these factors. So I guess the question, as I said, becomes then where do we want to look? Is it something that we do want to kind of have that narrow scope and say, okay, for our first piece of this, we're going to look at the medical side of it. So we do feel that an 1115 waiver is the best way to go about it. Or do we want to look at it uh, kind of more in a more broad scope and say what, you know, existing nutrition support programs are there that that we can utilize to maximize healthy eating and then leverage those or add additional funding or pieces to those to further incentivize individuals to eat healthier and then see the outcomes of those. Yeah. So I do feel like, so like in the bill and this task force original intent, we maybe 
for what for like beneficial or deleterious pigeonholed it as like medically because we called it an act concerning food as medicine. Um, and so I think that's the target. Um, and I will say from a outcomes evaluation standpoint, I think that when you look at the impact on disease, there is a, a more compelling story to be made for like long-term savings on Medicaid. So like this short-term investment in Medicaid could result in a long-term savings because we would reduce metformin. There's a really great paper um, and I'm working on a follow-up evaluation um, by Richard Bryce at all that documents a, um, a half a percent reduction in hemoglobin A1C from approximately 81 um, dollars in PPRX at in a farmer's market offered at an FQHC. And that is such a staggering number to me um, because metformin for a similar, for a year, you know, could be $2,000. Um, and so $81 of fresh fruits and veg compared to metformin. So that's, I think that there's like this compelling story. All that to be said, like if children have more access to fruits and vegetables at a young age, we can prevent them from ever achieving those disease statuses. Um, but I think documenting the benefit is a little bit different, um, but there still are children. And I think, you know, Dr. Trout has a good example of this that, that are in disease statuses that are related to nutrition related chronic disease, that this would be a significant benefit to. Um, and so we, I, I guess what I would like to say is I'd like to consider both and, um, but for this group, I think we've sort of focused on the medical framework and perhaps that was a mistake, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I would not uh, preclude myself from having made one, but um, I think that, I think that that's where we started, um, but I'm not convinced that that's the end, but I think you make a good point. And there are, and I think, you know, DOAG's examples of programs, they might not have the same data that the medical space has, but we certainly know that the farmer's market nutrition program um, offers significant benefit um, in uh, purchase, consumption, um, and diet quality. Like those metrics exist for the farmer's market nutrition program, but the research that I'm familiar with on that program is less disease status specific. And so I think it makes the data seem like a little bit less um, critical mass pivotal, but, um, but I'm not opposed if that feels like a more viable option to get something moving. We have another hand raised from Jean. I'm sorry if I did not pronounce that correctly. Hi, thank you. I was just, uh, as we were just talking, thinking about what Dr. Trout discussed earlier with um, the the familial impact of having a produce prescription program and that extended benefit, just the idea that something like that could provide the particularly like the people we're serving with the option to choose the fruit and vegetable that they're they're accessing and and you know contributing to their family. I think. We're discussing the the physical benefits, but gosh, what an emotional and social benefit that provides as well, and and what a great opportunity to kind of use this as a way to to touch more than than one issue. Sorry, I was muted. Um, thank you. Um, so I know that um, Connecticut Food Chair is partnering with Hartford Hospital on the foods pharmacy, I might, that might be the wrong name, um, but, um, um, you know, J David Juros and team um, there and the Connecticut Food Share team have been working on this food pharmacy, which is like a shopping experience. They're not specifically restricted to produce there, um, but have seen some significantly positive feedback. Um, they haven't done data evaluation yet, but I think that um, it's a, you know, I, th I think you're sort of spot on. Um, and I, I hope that we would be touching more than the people with the specific disease status, but I wonder if what Dan was getting at is mechanistically, if there's something that would have a broader, better impact, but um, I don't think we're pigeonholed per in perpetuity. I think we have a direction for now. It, was there another hand, Chandra? No. Okay. Um, so 
Um, I don't know if this is uh, a traditional request for a uh, working group, but what I would sincerely appreciate is if people could take these examples that were sent out in this email and like think about it, like look at the examples. If you know from your professional experience and colleagues, um, uh, you know, like uh, an example or benefit or something that we can anticipate and make an improvement from these other state examples, I would really love to hear and know about that. And so um, we, um, I would love an email back. Um, and I think I don't want to open the entire universe of membership of this committee to a reply all, but if you wouldn't mind um, sending feedback on those bill forms to either myself and Lucy and Chandra or um, some combination thereof, um, I would really appreciate hearing from the group members after they've had time to think about these examples. And knowing that there's a bill proposal um, that will hopefully get a public hearing and that um, in the public hearing, all of your feedback, you'll have all this time to think about it ahead of when the bill gets to an agenda and where you wanna go. And I hope we have folks ready to help us make this as strong as it can be. Um, so um, I don't want people to feel like this conversation has ended as a transition to um, the input from community organizers and academic partner um, agenda item. And so we specifically have asked Unite Us to participate. And as I introduced sort of in transition to them, um, the research scientist in me um, at, and former nonprofit leadership member um, has been really interested in the work Unite Us has been able to offer and promise other states adopting early Unite Us models. And I think legislators and policymakers, um, if you weren't already familiar with the work of Unite Us. Um, I think that it's gonna be a very telling um, source of data for us to consider policy implications and perpetuity in the work that we do from a very different lens than the traditional sources of data that we have. And so I'm grateful that they're interested in this work and have um, interest in presenting today because I think that the kind of data and metrics that they can collect through their system are unique and different from other opportunities that we have. And, um, and I'm just grateful and that for their interest and willingness to participate. So without further ado, I'm not sure who from Unite Us is presenting, but please feel free to take the mic and share screen share. Thank you, Brett Foster. Um, and it's really interesting to note that the way that we were originally thinking about supporting the Food is Medicine Project in Connecticut was in that framework of you know, hospital to CBO program I do hear Dan's comments. I, I think that they're really important. Um, and I, hopefully as you're hearing and listening to this presentation, you'll, you'll what will click is um, our statewide uh, social care coordination um, network in Connecticut could serve individuals from areas, geographic areas considered, you know, high needs for food assistance services because maybe it's a food desert or uh, what have you. So there are multiple ways to, I think, think about a project where you're supporting the traditional notion of food as medicine as, as like a, you know, sort of a clinical diagnosis and intervention, as well as uh, more traditional social service intervention. So really excited for possibilities here. Um, I'll try and share my screen here if you guys don't mind. Hopefully this works. Okay, wonderful. Hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, really the reason for why the company was founded is because social determinants of health often uh, play an outsized role in an individual's health and well-being outcomes. I think everybody's familiar with this data point at this point uh, during the pandemic. You know, it's modeled uh, in, in such a fashion. I think we're also all familiar with, um, you know, the layout here that uh, clinical care sort of, you know, only accounts for a certain small percentage of an individual's uh, health and well-being outcomes. And so how do you really connect health and social care to drive at the social drivers of health that are impacting an individual's clinical um, outcomes? Uh, the major differences between the sectors being, um, you know, the clinical sector, the health payers, health providers speak in a very standardized language. And in social care, there aren't data standards. There's no standard taxonomy. It's very difficult uh, to sort of compare apples to apples from an evaluation standpoint. 
Um, you know, food assistance can mean many, many different things. It could be in a large box of food, a small box of food, an emergency box of food. It could be a medically tailored meal. It could be, um, you know, food as medicine prescription. So you, what we're attempting to do, I think, is a company is really standardize those social service outcomes and map them to uh, clinical outcomes with our, our provider and our payer partners. Um, how we do that, it's through our coordinated care network. So there are several pieces uh, to our networks. One, they're tech enabled. Uh, the base core of what we provide to communities is this closed loop um, social care coordination platform, which is HIPAA compliant. We pair that uh, software technology with a community engagement approach, which puts boots on the ground in the communities that we're working in. These individuals engage with health, health and social care providers to help train them on the platform, teach them about um, utilization, teach them about uh, the benefit to adopting these new, um, you know, screening, assessment, referral, outcome capture workflows. Um, and, and really drive at network optimization in a way that I think a lot of other technology companies don't really do. Uh, and then of course we take a, a really hard look at, at data because we're capturing and um, evaluating individual client level data. We oftentimes can match uh, individuals to um, uh, uh, clinical records and really identify, you know, really big ROI, but but also we can identify much smaller benefits, um, including things like looking at health equity, the, the diversity of the population being served, um, and a number of different other examples. What this really looks like in practice on the ground is think about anybody who comes in contact with an individual care manager at a food bank, um, you know, a CHW, a home visiting nurse, anybody who could potentially identify uh, an unmet need on somebody's behalf could use our platform to screen for those, those needs, identify providers with the capacity to serve the individual, and then send that closed loop referral to an organization in the neighborhood that, that is able to serve the individual. And when that organization on the other end receives that referral, they can document the services that are being provided in real time and all of those updates are logged automatically and those outcomes are being captured and sent back to the original referring entity. So you're, we're, our sort of closing the loop is, is um, only considered finished when that outcome is captured and shared. Um, we think that this is an enhanced model for care coordination and it's really catching on. So we're in 44 states at the moment. Um, 22 states are considered statewide, which means that um, in every county in that state, there are providers that are live on our platform, sending and receiving referrals for all types of needs, whether it's food, housing, clothing, um, interpersonal violence, et cetera. Um, we're seeing sort of remarkable statistics when it comes to um, average time to referral acceptance rates particularly in North Carolina before we launched our statewide network there before the pandemic. Um, you know, we were identifying wait times of up to 16 or more days and uh, post deployment of our network, we've, we've driven that down to little less than two days on average, um, which is really, really fantastic. We are in Connecticut, like I said, uh, we started a, a network in 2019 with our wonderful partner in the Connecticut Hospital Association. Um, we have grown considerably. There are several individual hospitals that are, are leveraging the platform to send social care referrals on behalf of their patients. And we're partnered with a number of uh, nonprofit organizations across the state. We have more than uh, almost about um, 2,000 different social care programs that are available to receive referrals on, on the platform. Um, I think one of the most interesting statistics about Connecticut is actually the fact that we're seeing service times uh, that are faster on average for BIPOC individuals um, than the general population, which is of course um, not always the case on our networks, but something that we're very proud of in Connecticut. This is a little bit more granular information about the Connecticut network and the way that it operates, um, the individuals that it serves and, and um, some of the impact across sector value that we can identify just by making a few assumptions and, and um, off of you know, publicly available research. 
I think the really interesting thing um, to note on the slide is that um, we, even though um, we've only served roughly about 9,000 unique residents, that these um, residents in total represent um, almost 18,000 different care cases. So individuals are, are presenting with multiple needs and those needs are being met. Um, we're looking at top uh, service needs in Connecticut at the moment um, for housing, physical health, food assistance, and clothing. And what we can forecast at the moment is that, you know, this small sector or this small slice of individuals with needs in Connecticut um, and just connecting them with services and, and providing those services is providing a large benefit back to the state. However, we know that our work in Connecticut isn't finished. Um, we have modeled that there's roughly um, you know, a little less than a million residents that could be considered uh, at risk of, of, of social vulnerability. Um, the top need being financial assistance, food and housing. Uh, and so we know that there's a lot of work left to be done in Connecticut and hoping that partnerships through government and other institutions can help drive the acceleration of the work and reach a larger population. This is just a quick case study of a project that we did in New York City with our partners uh, that you'll see on the right hand side of the screen, where we were supporting uh, referral workflows from public uh, hospitals in the in the health and hospitals system into uh, community based organizations to to serve all kinds of food assistance needs, not just um, food prescription, but uh, emergency food, um, SNAP enrollment, and others. And um, PHS, Public Health Solutions, uh, our large nonprofit partner there, actually did the, the ROI study and uh, identified on a, an investment of a little less than $750,000 that there was $1.1 in annualized Medicaid savings based on SNAP enrollments, Medicaid enrollments, and other information. Um, I think the interesting thing to note about this study, um, a couple of things that I have here on the left-hand side, is just that 71% of patients who were screened in the program did report an emergency food need, and 86% of referrals resulted in a documented outcome, meaning that the workflow that was designed, the system that was used, um, and the capacity in the community were all sort of effective for the most part in serving these, these individuals. Um, there's some demographic information that stood out to us as we were reviewing the literature. 37% um, of participants were older adults, meaning 60 plus, and 21% of uh, participants were pregnant or, or with young and or with young children. Um, so really fascinating study. And this was all done uh, in 10 months during uh, some of the, the tougher times of, of lockdown and pandemic. Um, I did want to just quickly highlight, I, I think, a, an emerging um, need in the market that we're identifying, and this representative connects to the 1115 waivers and the paid social services that are being provided to the Medicaid uh, program in some states. But um, what we really heard from our CBO partners was that they're, we're interested in a better way of tracking financing, that, that um, Funders and and um, grantees needed a better way to communicate um, about the individuals that they were serving, and so we created a a product um, to be able to track funds down to the individual using that sort of base referral platform. And so there are three different instances in which this technology can be utilized. The community investment solution is is uh, designed really for large philanthropic organizations who are who are um, uh, providing funds to CBOs to to provide services to individuals. Community benefit is a is a take on that, but it's geared for nonprofit hospitals who have um, community benefit obligations and mandates that they must meet. And there's a technology component that's really critical in that program, which is the way that we can um, identify patient through a unique patient identifier, follow that individual through the community, and provide. Um, all kinds of evaluation metrics on how that individual was served back to the hospital. And um, we can take a deeper dive into clinical records, match those with social care records and identify um, uh, impact on, on health and well-being for those, for those individuals being served by that program. 
And the social care payment solution is, is really the, the tool that's in use in North Carolina and California at the moment serving those waivers. And so it's um, using a central, uh, essentially a, a fee schedule that's natively built into the platform uh, that allows CBOs to send medical claims to managed care organizations uh, for those that are eligible for the program and, uh, and they can get quickly reimbursed for the services that they, they provide. Um, so there are, you know, different ways that we can leverage our technology to to follow financing for these types of projects. But this is um, this is where the market seems to be going. We've hopefully answered the market need and are looking forward to working on more of these types of projects to provide all kinds of great information about the individuals being served by social services. I'm going to stop there. That, it was probably a lot. I'm happy to to take questions and, and Representative Foster would. Also toss it back to you. Thank you so much. I'm um, really excited and interested um, in seeing um, what continuous information that you find. Something that I just want to flag that you shared today that is different than what we've heard to date, but something that's always been top of mind and of interest is that, you know, we're talking about the social determinants of health and health equity um, in a lot of the work that we're doing, but having some of the demographic information that you have on the response to food nutrition might help us sort of identify in a pilot effort, um, specific de demographic data recollection efforts that might help us understand the sort of next steps and future directions. And I think that sort of circles back around to what Dan brought up. And that might be that piggybacking on WIC would make the most sense um, if pregnant moms are of particular vulnerability and um, WIC enrollment has declined nationally in the last, um, I don't want to say the wrong time unit um, and that data statistic is not on the top of my head, but it has been declining for a, a, a while. And so, you know, if we're finding that referrals to food service um, agencies is important um, for that specific demographic, that might be different than we think of, you know, in typical in a lot of health disparity work, we look at race and ethnicity and we look at zip code as areas of vulnerability, but we might look at um, maternity status um, or pregnancy as something that we should pay extra attention to. And so I'm grateful for that example that, you're, that you've shared. Um, do other people have comments or thoughts on the Unite Us presentation that can help us make sure that we're integrating um, that presentation efforts and sort of like the takeaways from it with the work that we'll continue to do? Or questions for Max? All right, so at this moment, I don't see anything, but I think that this is a really active group by email and I'm grateful to that. So if things come up, we'll make sure that they get forwarded appropriately um, and that we're integrating things that come. Um, are there other community organizations or academic members um, who have things to share, things that we have not considered so far that we should keep top of mind? And I'll just sort of say that this is not the only time where you'll be offered that opportunity to give that feedback, but we do want to make sure that we are taking um, community organizations perspectives and hopefully elevating the voice of potential program beneficiaries and um, sort of a data driven perspective on what the state of the science is telling us. Um, is best from a policy perspective and carrying that forward, so is there anything else. Um, any other groups that want to share their organization's perspectives or share the intent to share something later on? Um, well, we are a smaller and quieter group today than most days, and so I will move on. We have uh, an agenda item for input from others. Um, is there anything else that we have missed or anyone else that we have missed that would like to share a perspective um, as we go into this um, fast and furious time of the legislative cycle where we'll hopefully continue to move this work forward? Okay. Well, hearing nothing, um, I, I know that, that Heather had her yeah. raised. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Thank Great. you. Thank you. 
to the icon. Um, no, I was just going to um, add to the conversation earlier that um, between medically tailored meals or produce prescription, I would lean towards produce prescription from my perspective. Um, I think it uh, has a, a broader impact on Connecticut residents of, of any age. Um, although I do appreciate as a dietitian, medically tailored meals, I think um, there's a, a faster and uh, uh, impact with produce. And I, I appreciate that it would support local um, and it, it's typically, you know, more nutrient dense, fresh, you know, produce. So that's all I would add. Thanks for um, sharing the dietitian perspective, Heather. Um, sure. Uh, um, I'm, I'm grateful to everyone who has participated over time in being part of this group. And I am excited about a bill introduction and following it through this path um, through session. And I hope that folks continue to stay in touch and continue to um, send along information and articles and pilots they're hearing from in other states and organizations. Um, I have made, I feel like not just a lot more colleagues through this working groups effort, but a lot more friends of people who are rowing in the same direction in the space. And so I am really grateful to everyone who's given time in this. And I'm particularly grateful um, to my co-chair, Rep. Dathan, for her effort in this so far. Um, before we take a moment to adjourn, um, Rep. Gilchrist has joined us today, and I don't want to miss an opportunity to see if she has any thoughts as the chair of human services before we leave. And I'm sorry for putting you on the spot and not giving you a heads up that I was about to call on you. Not at all. Um, I, I said at the onset um, before you were able to join that I just was really interested in, in learning more and, and um, joining this group that has already been meeting and has done tremendous work. And um, look forward to seeing what language you submit and how I can help. So thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I'm really grateful. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with everyone on this and I hope this work isn't done. Um, I heard and made note of a permanent committee <laughs> along this lines, the original food is medicine um, bill um, went from being implementation to a uh, working group um, task force plan um, to where we ended up now without legislative um, uh, effort momentum making us do this, but just sort of the um, gumption of Rep. Dathan and I to make this happen. Um, and I'm grateful to everyone who took the time to be a part of this effort. Um, I'm hoping it's not the end, but a beginning, and I'm looking forward to working with everyone. So um, I guess I'll give folks back some time on their evening, and I'm grateful to everyone, and I look forward to staying in touch. Bye, everyone. Uh, so Thank without you. the meeting's adjourned. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.